Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. Welcome back to another week of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. And I'm giving you the NPR voice because we have a Zen on Zen episode. My guest, Mike Brockway, runs Zen House Homes. And we're going to talk all about bringing Zen hospitality to short-term rentals. This is a great show. It's another great journey. And what I like about talking to real estate investors every week is the journey, the full journey, not all of the highlights or the shiny stuff for Instagram. It's the way to go from the beginning to the current and then see how far out you want to take it. And it's different for everybody. It may be different for you. I appreciate you listening. Not even going to give you any things about the podcast. You know what to do. Let's get to Mike. He's a great guy. Let's go. This is episode 114 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Mike Brockway. Mike is an investor, entrepreneur, and the owner of Zen House Homes, which does a lot of short-term rentals. We're going to talk all about it. Mike, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, man. I'm excited. I'm going to start here because no one else is going to know the answer to this besides you. Why did it take so long for that pizza at BPCon when I first met you on the last <laughs> night? <laughs> the things investors have to worry about. The longest wait. We had the longest wait for pizza in the history of anything that's ever occurred. I know, man. That was that was a, that was definitely a long wait, but I think that pizza <laughs> tasted a little bit better once we got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that actually will lead us into what you're talking about. We were talking about just before. You're working on a really big project, and then we'll back into a lot of the other projects. But what is the project that you're working on now in terms of large scale short term rentals, and why is it such a such a big deal for you? Yeah, this is, this is definitely a project I've kind of graduated into over time and just built up that comfort level, just like anything else out there, right? And just going into it with the mindset of okay, there's there's risk here, but there's also big upside. And so for me, I think it was just a it was the next next logical thing for me to level up and yeah. Kind of diving into the project it itself it's a it's a big four thousand square foot house and it has a pool and it has a lot of space on that lot so i basically have taken we're going through the interior and the exterior just to create a super cool property and provide just like a next level airbnb experience the type of asset or property that isn't super common in denver i think it's very common in areas like scottsdale and other markets yeah. that have really leaned into airbnbs but I just wanted to level up and offer a superior product. So th th these type of large scale short term rentals, these are really guide towards either multiple families coming or groups maybe doing these kind of mini conferences or getaways, right? Yeah, definitely. This property will sleep 20 people yeah. in beds. So I, I'm going all, <laughs> all, all king size beds. Not a quintuple decker bed in a, in a very tiny closet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually avoiding bunk beds because my cleaners hate bunk beds during yeah. turnovers so like, okay this is a big property for them let's make this streamlined keep it easy on them keep it easy easier on the cleaning fee but yeah to your point this is a big property that's for either a super large family or some families coming together or a company doing a retreat something to that sort and i've also yeah. designed the property we're building it out in a way where it can be split up into two units if we wanted to lock oh. off the basement, there's actually a separate entrance already. There's going to be a, a kitchen down there as well. This way, I have the optionality to rent it out to two separate groups if necessary. Yeah, and that also gives some kind of inter-privacy for groups that are coming in larger groups. Like you can put all the kids downstairs, keep them quiet, adults yeah. upstairs. I do like the slideability of these bit larger scale projects because I feel like when people used to do events, they were always thinking big scale, big scale, you know, I'm going to go to convention center. 
but nobody really needs to do that. And I think more people in spaces of coaching are moving towards these smaller mastermind groups where it could be 20 people. And mm -hmm. that's a perfect opportunity because they're getting paid to bring in the clients to have it. And then they can rent something, but everyone's around each other all the time. So I think it really does work in a business context for that as well. Have you seen that, though, in the other areas? I've seen that in Scottsdale as well, just in terms of what's going in there. It's not just all families. Yeah, I've definitely seen signs of it here and there. A few of my properties are on the smaller side, but with, when it comes to my two larger properties that I own, there's a wide variety of guests. And to your point, I think that's just a better environment for like more impactful conversation, retreats, um, whatever it may might be, right? Yeah. I try to go to large conferences. That's you know where you, you and I saw each other last at BPCon. Yeah. But when you're in a small, intimate setting, you know, that's definitely can be very impactful and, you know, very helpful for every, everyone from families to to corporations or companies. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go all the way back. Growing up, was real estate something that you were interested in, you know, in the teenage type years? It's it was part of my life, I would say, because I I basically worked with my dad doing like light property management. And that's yeah. kind of where I became like somewhat handy. But I never thought that I would be doing this, quite frankly. I wanted to go to school, get my MBA, work in business. And as soon as I had that desk job, though, after I did all the schooling, I realized it was a little soul sucking and it wasn't wasn't for me. Yeah. Well, so did your family want you to go the business route? Because a lot of families are just like, hey, let's just do that. Or were they open when you pivoted and said like, I don't really want to sit at a desk all day? They definitely wanted me to go the business route. And the individual that my, my dad worked for growing up, he was like one of the first or oldest employees at McKinsey and Company. And I always looked up to him and said, hey, that's, what I, that's who I want to be when I grow up. I want to be wealthy. Yeah. I want to have like this a badass summer property or summer summer home. But even in talking with him, when I was in my first job in um, asset management, he basically said like, hey, like, you don't want to work at McKinsey and do what's required to get where I'm at today. And that was tough for me to hear. And yeah. so that kind of was eye opening. And then as I transitioned from my day job W2, to running a business and becoming an entrepreneur, my I think my mom specifically, she's very like risk averse. She was very she was nervous, but she definitely had trust in me to, you know, do what I thought was best. And she was pretty hands off there. So I appreciate and respect that she was a little bit worried, but she let me yeah. do my thing. Yeah, but don't you think now that your view different from when you were thinking about what wealth or was when you looked at him at McKinsey, now you're the way that you look at wealth is probably different. You know, multiple properties generating income is not something that a lot of us think of as a kid. And it's not traditional. So it doesn't make sense. So for you now, just yourself, but even for family, it's they can see the results. Has that changed kind of the way you've looked at it and everybody else as well? Yeah, 100%. I mean, there's so many different ways to generate income, right? And, you know, people that are super successful will say like, hey, have d various different income sources, however many that might be given your scenario. And wealth to me has taken an even different route, I would say, because true wealth, yes, you want to be financially stable and you want to have that income and that peace of mind to fuel a solid lifestyle. But true wealth for me has transitioned from becoming just dollars and cents to you know quality of life, your yeah. relationships, the people around you. Are you happy? Are you healthy? You know, how are you actually like living day to day? And what fulfills you? Because because I think I quickly realized that I would hit a goal and I would just move the goalpost, but I wasn't necessarily getting that fulfillment and that happiness. Yeah. And, and those goals, yeah, were numbers. And I think that even investors fall into that. We were talking about that when we went in October, you know, the goalpost is, could be amount of doors, but then when you adjust it the way that you said, and it's like, well, I want to be part of, I want to have freedom to do what I want when I want, and I want to be able to generate income from things that I enjoy. Do you, I mean, do you love what you do now? Because I know from talking to you that you really enjoy it, but I don't think all investors do. How is it for you? And how do you think that's, it's been different for you than maybe everyone who's, I have 10 properties, but I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely been a learning experience. I'll say that. Right. And which, which is great because you can, you can decide and, and figure out like what you like about maybe a certain strategy, whether it's long-term rentals, medium-term, short-term, whether you're flipping, you'll figure out over time like what you actually enjoy within those strategies. 
and then you can hone in on what you actually enjoy. To answer your question, yeah. I think I definitely enjoy what I'm doing now. But for me, it still feels like a means to an end because I'm evolving as a person. I'm evolving. My priorities are evolving. And how much time I want to spend on my business is evolving. So one of, one of my themes is creating simplicity this year. After this project, I definitely don't want to like dive into another massive hands-on project because yeah. I've found that this is as, as confident as I am in my skill set, it still keeps me up at night sometimes. And so let's, let's figure out how to eliminate that from my life and I'll be happier in the long run. Yeah. But the important thing is I know you're, you're going to see it through because you know that the asset's good. You know, sometimes you're in an asset and you realize like, actually, this nothing about this works and you just want to get rid of it. You know, this asset's going to have a big return, but you also know I, I'm not going to look to do that again right away. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Before this, before jumping on here with you today, we, I was speaking to my, our good friend, Alyssa Holbrook, yeah. and she said something you and I share is, you know, we're willing to admit when we make mistakes as well. And I've had assets that just didn't make sense, one in particular. And I kind of went outside of my scope and mm. thought it was like the next cool thing, right? And I ended up se selling it at a loss. And that's just part of the journey. I, I learned from that. I won't, I, I've decided to stay in my lane and not invest in that asset class. Yeah. And when it comes to this asset, I know the ARV, I know the, the game, I know the revenue it can generate. And that, that's why I'm sticking to this type of project. Yeah. And I mean, your main asset class now is short-term rentals, right? Yeah. Yeah. Single family and small multifamily short-term rentals. Yeah. So how many units do you have that are on active rentals now as short-term or mid-term? I have nine short-term rental units right now that are that are active. Are they are they all near you in Denver, or were they? I thought there were maybe a couple that were outside. I've looked at other markets, but I think I've I decided just to all stay within the Denver metro area. So that's that's north of the city and primarily west of the city, where regulation is more favorable than the city of Denver. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that a little. How important has it been to you to understand the regulations of short term? I mean, obviously, now going to this many units, you know it. But I think there's a lot of people who look at short term rentals, don't think about it. They think, well, it shouldn't be that hard. And then you can really end up with trouble, especially if you're doing something larger. And then you can't get the income out of it that you expected. Yeah, the, the regulation and being in tune with that is super important. And I, I definitely give kudos to one of my realtors I work with out here. Chantel Dwayne, and she's just very in tune with that. And I think as an investor who's, you know, purchasing properties here and there, I'm definitely in touch with that. But having the people around you and the team and the experts out there, that's definitely helped me be more comfortable. And just making an effort to keep that top of mind and stay in touch when it comes to regulation. Earlier this week, actually last weekend, I had lunch, sorry, coffee with the mayor of one of the towns that I invest in. It's a very small area with favorable regulation, but mm. they are making changes, and I'm part of the part of that process. And I'm very, very involved there. And we were on a panel this past week, myself, another investor, and just just staying in touch with that stuff and being on top of it is super important. And then also having optionality. To your point, if the property doesn't work as a short term rental, I want it to be able to work as a medium term rental or maybe a long term rental. Right? I do have a couple properties that I would have to utilize a different strategy like corporate housing or even sell. But just having that optionality when you're getting started is super important, in my opinion. Yeah. And like you said, even when you sold the asset class that was different for you at a loss, you still get back the down payment. I mean, sometimes it's about the acceptance of that wasn't a, a right move instead of continually trying to put the square peg in the circle. It's just like we all can see it doesn't fit. Why are we doing it? Why did you buy that alternative asset? Was it like a little bit of FOMO or you just thought, like, hey, I should be more diversified. I don't want to be all short term, midterm. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And when I when I sold it, I the headspace that I gained back was was even more important than the money itself. Mm. Right. Yeah. That that focus. But I initially got into that asset. It was a triple net property a warehouse. Oh. But that's interesting because before you even tell us the story, triple net's allegedly one of the easiest assets. You know, it's supposed to just make money on its own. So I'm interested to hear why it didn't work for you. Yeah, <laughs> it definitely wasn't a straightforward deal. I, I owned a business that was able to get SBA financing. And so I saw that opportunity to utilize the SBA financing with a low down payment to get into this asset class. So the, the asset mm. actually was utilized by the business. 
And we were going to rent a portion out to another business and kind of like house hack a commercial asset. And my long-term goal with the property was once the business moved or grew, I would still retain the asset. Well, we just ran into some roadblocks with the, bit, the success of the business as I was not focusing on it and focusing full-time on real estate. Yeah. And the just interest rates went up and the SBA actually... When we moved and closed the business, the SBA did not love that. And that's a stipulation of the loan. And so it just made the most sense to sell the property instead of trying to refinance it or retain it. And I, quite frankly, just didn't have the desire to manage it, hold on to it, and add the value it needed to become a property that'd be attractive to tenants. Yeah. And I think it's interesting what you said, because you probably could have, if you stuck to it, figured out a way to make it work, but it would have taken uh, maybe 50% of your headspace for, for an asset that wasn't 50% of your income. So that's where the decision is made. Why do you think some investors now, and we both know a lot of them, have trouble making those decisions, you know, that they lock in on a flip or something and you're like, well, this isn't going to go well. We all, all of us out here can see like you're under, it's not going well. Why can't they let go? I think they're probably struggling with like the concept of le- less is more and the shiny object syndrome. Yeah. Very easy to see someone else doing something and say, okay, they're crushing it or it, it, it's perceived that they're crushing it on social media. I should go do that same thing, right? And I'll have the same results. And so, especially when you're trying to figure things out and you're in, in that growth phase, it's very easy to say, hey, I want some of that. It looks amazing. <laughs> yeah. The grass is always greener on the other side. Yeah, I think I still do that. But I also know to stop like I'll get off of a podcast that you know, I have on like a land flipper. And I'm like, this sounds awesome. And then I look into it for three days. I'm like, it's not for me. Like just because it's not my personality, and they have years built up of doing it. And I don't want to just find one thing. So I do I I like the idea of like exploring the other assets. But it's really important that you made that decision for yourself. Because now you go back focused, and you don't even have to focus on that other business entity as well. It just brings back the focus and it probably helped you move more to go on to this larger project that you're on now. Yeah, exactly. That that needs all my my focus, my bandwidth to make it successful. So you're also when you do that, you're also pulling from your, your bread and butter at the same time. So you're maybe suffering or losing money in both both arenas. Yeah. Over your course of time in short term rentals, what are some of the biggest lessons as an owner and kind of operator in this hospitality business that you've learned that you could tell to other people? You know, a lot of people do think it's easier, like we said, but there's a lot of intricacies to being a short term rental owner and doing it well. So you don't lose money, get bad reviews. What are some things that you found that are just absolute musts? I would say overall, it's, it's definitely who not how game. And you can definitely when you when you start off, you have to wear all the hats, you have to learn everything, right. But I've definitely found there are things that I'm just not good at, or I don't love doing. And it's a hospitality business at the end of the day. And so you have to have that customer service hat on all the time. Yeah. And so I've, I've brought some folks into my business, whether it's a virtual assistant, or local people. One of my examples, one of my cleaners, she owns her business, but she wants to learn and grow. So I've had her help me with guest messaging as an example. And yeah. So she's much more friendly than I am, <laughs> uses much better emojis than I do and smiley faces and makes that guest feel much better. Yeah. And so I would just say, think about as you're approaching it, think about the long term. What do you actually want to do? What makes you happy? And what do you need to outsource or build systems for so you can eventually outsource that? But when you're taking on your first Airbnb, obviously, you need to bootstrap it. But just keep in mind like what your long-term goal is and does this business align with those long-term goals you've set for yourself? Yeah, that's really good advice because the way that you looked at it was I want to learn everything, but I'm thinking of it as a business. So which of these things do I not like outsource quickly? And I think too many investors don't look at their entire investment portfolio, whether it be one property, a multi or two or 10 as an entire business. I mean, you're running a real estate investment firm of some kind and figuring out where all the pieces are going to match. And that's why it probably helps you to be all in generally one area in terms of cleaning, using the same people to support the properties. Is that a big help for you? Yeah, 100 percent. And, you know, my my background in financial services and asset management says, hey, you should diversify and have a well-balanced portfolio. And so you could say I'm very concentrated in Colorado in like the Denver metro area. But I think Denver is a super strong city. 
there's solid growth. There's people traveling here not only for vacation. It's not just a drive to vacation destination. And yeah. so I see the all the positive factors there. And on top of that, like you said, it's helped me or allowed me to build a team and just vertically integrate things into my business. I have solid handyman contacts. I have solid cleaners. Everything is within maybe 15 minute drive from all these properties. So it makes it very easy for me to scale and at least try to become more passive in a very active business. Yeah. And I think it would just be so much harder when you try to assemble a team like that for short term outside of, I mean, cleaners are always the most important because they're the ones who are going to basically get you the reviews by making sure it's okay. So if you just decide, Hey, I want to check out Charleston, South Carolina, and you don't know anyone, you're going to choose the first people to get something up and running. And that's always the thing that loses you money. And over time, do, do you feel like you learned how to manage the managers? That's what I feel like is important as you're growing your business. Like you said, okay, I want to learn this, but now I'm going to help the cleaners going to start to do this, but you know how to manage them because you've seen what it takes, even though you, you smartly said, you know, I don't want to be the front person with the emojis. Like that's the same for me. I'm not that warm and fuzzy. So I'm just going to be like, fix it. I don't really care. So I know that's not good for business. So I had to outsource that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And just from your first property to your your fifth or your 10th property or Airbnb, you come across of a lot of different employees or subcontractors or cleaners, and you quickly learn what systems work best, right? And I would say my, my situation might be fairly unique, but also I, I talk to other investors that have the same scenario where they start working with someone, whether that's a cleaner or a property management company or a handyman, and they grow together. Yeah. So my cleaner specifically, she, you know, she definitely is really good at certain things, but systems, tech, automation, those were not her strong suits. So we yeah. actually grew together and I helped her implement going from like a paper calendar to a Google calendar to a Slack channel to a Discord channel. So she could have all her team in one spot and all her clients in one spot as well. And just optimizing your business alongside someone else's business or one of your partners was super important for me. Yeah. And that's almost like trickle down vertical integration. You know, you vertically integrated your business and then you're helping her vertically integrate her business. So you have all of these things that start to work in a similar fashion. And then that does help you grow together much better. If somebody's using a completely different system, it's very hard to make sure that you're all on the same page. You know, you have eight people in a Slack channel and one person who's like, what's Slack? I want to go on Facebook. It's just mm -hmm. not going to, there's not going to be a lot of cohesion in there. Hey, it's Jonathan, just taking a brief break from this episode to talk to you about Royal Legal Solutions. I had Scott Royal Smith on episode 92 of the podcast. You can go back and check that one out after you finish this episode. And he opened my eyes to how much protection I was losing every year that I didn't activate, build a team and protect my assets. You can get information about Royal Legal Solutions by using my link at bit.ly slash zen royal. And bit.ly is bit dot ly slash zen royal. You'll find a lot there. You'll find a 30 minute video to watch with Scott. And I can guarantee you what you hear on the podcast is exactly what you're going to hear in that video. So give it a try. I'm down the rabbit hole right with you. Let's get back to the show. What's the breakdown of your properties? I know you said a couple or multis, and that must help because you were saying before, you know, I guess some people would say maybe you're not that diversified because you're Denver and you're short-term rental, but each property I always feel is, is different. So you have some different types of properties in there, even if they're being rented the same ways. What's the makeup of those properties? Yeah, I'd say about 50% of them are small multifamily properties where there's either two Airbnbs in one property or one Airbnb and then one to three long-term rentals in that same mm -hmm. property if it's if yeah. that, in that case where it's a quadplex. And then the, and the other half are primarily single family rentals that I either owned prior as a long-term rental that I converted to a short-term rental. Yeah. In that case, I know the long-term rental rates will support that investment. I'm just juicing, I'm just throwing gas <laughs> in the fire when I converted to a short-term rental. 
And then a couple others, it's a few others I purchased primarily as large single family high end short term rentals being the goal yeah. of that property. I I love the splits and multis of say you have a fourplex, two short term, two long term, because it gives you that kind of, okay, you know, you're going to get this amount. But like you said, I'm going to juice up the other side. Is that why you like those four plexes, three plexes? You can experiment. And if you have a friend or something who needs a long term rental for a year, you can just give it to him at a good rate and you're still going to be fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I like those because it makes me feel like that's my the safer side of my portfolio. And if you think about your traditional investment account, you have your stocks and your bonds. Like I look at those long term rentals or those 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 small multifamily properties that have long term rents coming in, but also short term rents coming in yeah. as the stable side of the portfolio. No matter what, unless you know we go through COVID again or something crazy happens, that property is always going to sustain itself, no matter what, right? And so that just makes me sleep better at night knowing that I'm also taking risks, larger risks like this big one that I'm that I'm working on right now. Yeah. Well, it's like you said, you the ones that you converted where, where you had them as long-term first, you already know they're viable as long-term rentals. So when you have a split in a building, two are long-term, you know what the comps are. They're right next door. So if you, if you go three months with a short-term and you're not beating them, you're like, well, it would just be easier. I'm spending way more on cleaning than I need to. Uh, so I think that's a good way to evaluate. But I think it's a sneaky play for investors. A lot of people are thinking house hack. And when I think house hack, I, I think live in one side and short term rental the other or mid term rental the other, you're just going to make more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, I think that's been part of my strategy is just being, I guess, sneaky in a way, but also making my own rules. You know, who, who, who's to say that you can't combine multiple strategies in one property right. or buy a single family property and add a second unit to it, add, add a, have a walkout basement. I have a scenario where I purchased a large triplex and then I converted it to a quadplex. And in that property, there is one short-term rental that's that's even juiced the returns even more, right? Yeah. So just just being scrappy and figuring out how to how to be strategic, maybe sometimes making your own rules, assuming that the the risk reward is there. I think has been been key to my success personally. Yeah. Did you have any issue with the town and going from three to four? At least where I am, three to four is actually a little bit easier because they both need the same requirements. But two to three is very difficult because three requires uh, different types of egress from the top or bottom and different types of security measures. So w was that an issue at all going from three to four? Or was there just extra space? Um, there was just extra space. And I technically it's not it's a fourth unit as far as zoning goes and so i just have a mother three plus one exactly that's what I call yeah, yeah, so yeah i kept it i went the path of leash resistance there and just called it a mother-in-law unit but it is yeah. its own self-sustaining unit and it did help me increase those returns at the end of the day after making that investment yeah were any of the single families that you bought were any of those those kind of mother-in-law mother-daughter types those are very sneaky for investors i mean I, lo I love them because you can like you said you can kind of off book rent one or you can really rent one it's okay the way that they're laid out yeah i, I actually the two that i own that are like that they both already had kitchens in the other units and so they were they were set up like that already even though they weren't yeah. zoned duplex right so that was just pretty easy for me to say hey i'm just updating i'm just doing cosmetic updates to these properties i'm not necessarily changing them from when i purchased made that purchase yeah. i'm sure that i'm still responsible at the end of the day but for me it was just a kind of a no-brainer as far as purchasing that property yeah i think that's smart uh, like opportunity when you're looking at properties too where some people who are just buying a single family for themselves may think differently like my house that i bought here where i am now I had, there was a two-car garage and there was a unit over the top and i was like well i can either rent this or one of my kids can live there and my daughter lives there now it has everything except the stove so these and i i grew up like that i grew up living in you know weird adus because we were you know we were too loud but i think what you're saying and what your properties show is that you're looking for these extras that other people aren't going to see the value in so over time you're going to gain more and more value and cash flow out of something that maybe people didn't even realize you know they looked at it as three there's nothing else you can do there you know or a single family you know i don't have a i don't have a mother in law so who's going to live in that unit i'll turn it into a living room but that's not good use of getting more money yeah yeah for sure and, and there's definitely a time and place for that right as you as you're getting started and you want to be utilizing this i guess this house hacking strategy or the strategy where you're kind of playing in the gray area that's definitely great 
And that's from there, then you graduate into different things, right? And but you've built that platform and that knowledge base and and you've done what you needed to do to to level up. And so I think it's just part of the progression and part of the learning experience that is probably part of a lot of a lot of investor strategy over time. Yeah. So did did you start off managing like your first short term rental and figuring out <laughs> what works until you realize like I'm not the best responder for these all these ridiculous questions that people ask? Yeah. And I still self manage I would say. I just have a little bit of help here and there. Yeah, yeah. And we've actually taken this a step further. We actually manage properties for other people as well. And that's a sele- that's definitely case by case scenario. I as an in- individual got into real estate or even my past career, I always wanted to help people. And so I've had just had friends that were like, "Hey, I want to get into Airbnb space or I want to I want to buy a short term rental, but I have no idea what I'm doing, right?" Yeah. And so we will actually take the property help them hire the designer, help them get it furnished, help them with the systems, the tech, and then manage the property. So it's like a coaching consulting route. Yeah. Again, it's case by case. It's, it's, it's just word of mouth, friends of friends. But it's allowed me to keep my team busy. So the cleaners, the handymen, um, yeah. all the contractors, they are... they have my, Because my business is more scaled up, they have more work and I'm keeping them busy and keep them on the team. Yeah. You said an important word that I think some people who aren't well versed in short term rentals probably wouldn't think about it. But designer was the one. Why is the design of short term rentals now so important? You and I, obviously, we follow a lot of the same people and you're doing what we're going to talk about at your larger property. But amenities and the design are so important now. How much have you seen that change since your first one to now? Yeah, that's a really good point. It's night and day. The first my short term rental, my first short term rental I, you know, designed by myself <laughs> with a friend, with a female friend of mine, just because I wanted her take, right? I'm like, okay, I can't do this myself. Like, who can I ask to help me pick the paint color or the furniture yeah. or, the, or the theme, right? And we just did it. We did a mid-century modern theme, which was easy. Um, and I think I spent like between furniture I had and furniture I bought off Facebook Marketplace, I think we spent like $3,000 <laughs> on that unit. It was a two bed, two bath. And now I'm spending upwards of fifty to seventy thousand dollars on furnishing some of these properties, especially this four thousand square foot property I'm doing now. And the designer is key there. I mean, I I would never, you never want to make an investment without um, consulting the right people and having the right team. And so I'm not going to go out there and spend this kind of money, yeah, buy this kind of property, and not ensure that everything is going to be cohesive. And fit together. There's also a data aspect to this as well. Airbnbs that target a certain avatar, a certain demographic, that are family friendly, different aspects. And like you said, have those amenities. Those are the ones that are going to get booked, have the higher occupancy, and those are the ones will have the higher ADR or your average daily rate as well. So there's a huge hiring a designer is well worth it and it's it's a great ROI. Yeah, and it's actually built into Airbnb's algorithm because the more looks, the more books, the more everything, the more that it gets pushed to the front, you know, of everyone, especially in a town like Denver where there's there's a lot. You know, you go to a small town, there's three or four. But have you found that coming out of the pandemic where, you know, everybody was trying to find Airbnbs and then the alleged collapse of short-term rentals, right. which is not a real thing, but that now it is since it is a little bit more competitive, that is the competitive edge there because it's what's viewable. And I know I'm very aesthetic person. When I'm looking, I'm when I look for short term rentals, which I've stayed in for more than 20 years and, and managed my own for so long, I'm looking for those ones that look cool and have the amenities because that's why I'm going. Yeah, hundred percent. And if there's if there's one if they're side by side and both individuals are dropping their pricing during this um, short term rental collapse that we did not <laughs> see at all in Denver. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, at least the ones that are operating professionally. You're going to pick that property that has that extra amenity, that hot tub, that sauna, that gym, which I put in most of my properties, and or that game room, right? So it's just it's just kind of a no brainer. It's worth the investment. I'd rather go harder into the paint, invest in my properties, and ensure that they're going to be top notch and not get overlooked when people potentially stop traveling or decide to spend less money or have less discretionary income. Yeah. You hit on a couple amenities, uh, gym, sauna, 
game room. What are some others that you think are really important? Obviously, I, I've seen if people can build a pickleball court, they're building it now. I was watching Rob, Rob build, build like three pickleball courts in Arizona. I'm like, that does look fun. That that That's a reason to go and you're going to get a lot more. What other amenities, especially in this large scale one that you're working on, are you looking to put in there? Um, I think the hot tub, which I mentioned, I have some really solid data. I had a property that was operating for a year without a hot tub and then I added a hot tub, right? And I saw like an over 30% increase in revenue. But I will say that I got better at managing. I got better at pricing. And mm. the property just had more track record on Airbnb. Airbnb saw it as a property that's going to have longevity on their platform. So I can't attribute all that to the hot tub. But I do believe the hot tubs more than pay for themselves as an amenity between the power hookups, the hot tub, and the maybe the platform or patio you build. Yeah. Other amenities, this property has a pool specifically. It's my first property with a pool. But I've just looked at comps and talked to other investors in my market. Pools are not very common here. And so you can charge, it's a, it's a supply demand metric. You can charge mm -hmm. a lot more for a property that has a pool. And with this property, I'm splitting it up into potentially two units. So it'd be a shared pool. I have other properties that have shared hot tubs where that's do other duplexes. And those have worked out just fine. And both properties. That's are funny unit. though, because that doesn't sound like it would work out fine to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, and everyone says that too, and we're just very, very transparent about, hey, this is a duplex. There are shared amenities of this property, and it still gets booked because it's so nice compared to the competition. People are still booking it. Yeah, and and generally, if you're vetting the people right, and your your you know your listings show exactly what's there, their expectations are are met. You've already told them there's not a surprise. You just the worst thing anyone could ever do is have a hot tub and make it look like it was one person, and then the neighbor hops in, you know, in their underwear. Yeah, and, and you're getting a one star review. So that is important, though, the transparency of the listing and saying like, hey, you know, you guys can work it out. But generally, you're kind of you know judging the tenancies who are coming in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And hopefully this property just books as a whole house because that's the easiest way to manage it. Right. But if we're in the slow season or so, you know something happens in the market, at least we can utilize the two-unit approach to still continue to generate revenue. Yeah. Across all of your properties, what's your take on Instant Book? Do you allow Instant Book or not? I'm not a fan of Instant Book because I just feel like I'm going to get the ones who are going to give me a one-star review. So I want to see a little bit before what they're going to say. What do you think about that? Because I, I do think it matters. I just think everyone has a different view. Yeah. Good question. I think I would agree with that. Depending on who you talk to, some do it, some don't. We have it set up in a way, whether it's through Airbnb or the third-party um software we use where they have to have a few criteria and i believe it's a photo um, they have to have at least one they have to have a five-star rating on airbnb and just some sort of verification i think identity verification yeah so if they have 4.5 stars or they don't have a profile photo or they don't hit the metrics they're not allowed to instant book yeah oh so, that makes sense mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good a good vetting mechanism. But I want to get your take on this. I haven't talked about this in a while, but it was a th we used to run it. They were at the time we were on Verbo and HomeAway, and we had a very strict short term rental rule. It was if they we we would continually for the first year curate our description so we knew nothing was missing based on feedback. You know, in the beginning, you realize you left some stuff out. How close to town? And then after we got it right and we knew we're not missing anything, whenever someone asked a question before they booked, we just immediately declined <laughs> because it's like that person is the one who's like, the grill doesn't work and this doesn't work. So we would just immediately decline. We wanted people who were like, oh, the description. I never ask a question when I yeah. book. I just read the thing. It looks great. I just book it. How do you feel about that? Is that a good strategy now? <laughs> I think that's a fair strategy. And I, I would attribute um, those guests that are, you know, more of a pain in the butt and more high maintenance with the ones that are 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 asking 21 questions on the front end, yeah, where they could actually easily go find the answer themselves. <laughs> yeah, well, that I mean, if, if the answer is in the description, then it's an immediate, you know, block. If it's just a dumb question, then I really have to weigh it like, is this going to continue? We just we always had a, a grill where all you had to do was press the button and it lit. And every time somebody would go there, it would either be we can't turn on the TV or we can't start the grill. And we'd send my sister's best friend over. She would walk in and go hit it and it goes on. And they're like, oh, I didn't know how to do it. And there's literally instructions hanging right there. Yeah. And you know, we had instructions everywhere. And those are the 
I, I feel like the modern Airbnb uh, visitor has gotten a little bit better just in general because it's more popular, I think, than it was, you know, 10 mm-hmm. years ago. But uh, yeah, that's, I don't know. I just, I never like the, hey, I just want to give them all back all their money. So they stop this, which we've, we had to do multiple times. So just like, I can't, you just need to leave. Like I can't, I can't do it anymore. What do you do though? When you do have a problem visitor, that's a tough one. If, if it's, you know, you're balancing a five-star review versus maybe something in AIN, and sometimes they're right. We're saying the ones that aren't right, they're just being uppity. Yeah. Good question, because it is a true balance, right? Because you live and die on reviews as far as these some of these platforms go. Um, and you want to keep that super host status and you want to keep stay high in the algorithm. So what I always try to do is is get them on the phone and just have like a human conversation with them. Yeah. Because over the app, it's tough. I mean, you want to definitely document certain things over the app. Right, right. And there's definitely That's a stra- good, both good points, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely strategy in documenting that because if you do so in the right way, you can reach out to Airbnb and say, hey, they're basically like bribing me for a five-star review, right? <laughs> yeah. And so over time, I've kind of just learned how to what questions to ask on the app to maybe get guests to say like, just some guests are just trying to get money back, honestly, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so and so they'll play the game, but some guests genuinely have issues, right? So in those cases, I'm like, okay, I want to get that person on the phone, figure out what it is, figure out what what's how to compensate them, and just ensure like, hey, and I explained to them like, hey, this is a customer satisfaction discount or refund we're giving you, and so our goal here is like, hey, if we refund you, do you feel like you're having a five star experience? <laughs> yeah, for the money you paid. Yeah. Um, well, there's also a big difference between things that were clearly left out and things that no, like, you know, if an air handler breaks, no one knew that was going to happen. You know, if you don't have any knives in the house, like that's your fault. You know, those are different, different things. So I think, and we were both talking in the beginning about just accountability of ourselves. I think you have to be that way as an owner. This obviously applies to landlords, but in the short-term rental game, it's fast. You know, you can have five, six, seven bookings in a month and you have to acknowledge, oh, well, the last guest left garbage in there and the cleaner missed it. That's yeah. on, you know, that's on us as the person running it. And you have to be apologetic about that or you're going, you're not going to do well, you know, on the app overall. Yeah. And I, and I think another, another tip I'd offer is don't be afraid to, there are a lot of services out there like Instacart and certain things. So if, the, if they're short on an, on an item, they need like toilet paper or soap, you can get it sent to their doorstep really quickly <laughs> yeah. and save yourself the trip. Or you would, you'd be surprised how far like sending them a gift, bottle of wine, an order of crumble cookies on their doorstep that also yeah. goes a long way. So people are feel like they you care, and then they leave that five star review that you're looking for. Yeah, oh, that's a good point though. On on entry for things, are you doing anything on entry? I've been to a few where they knew we were coming for a long time, and then there's stuff in there. You know, it's nice, especially if you're in a locality where you can work with local businesses. I think people have used that as a good strategy as well. Yeah. We've started to do things around certain holidays, so like Christmas. We we had through some decor out there, and that's because some of my team, one of my cleaners, she actually wanted to do that. I'm like, okay, hey, if you want to, if you want to run, <laughs> yeah, sounds that, good. <laughs> go for it, right? And but we haven't we haven't necessarily done done something that's super custom per se or something extra per se yeah. as far as like cookies or a bottle of wine or, or things of that nature. Yeah, I like the idea of gifts, but when it comes to like food and drink, I always worried like I don't want to send a bottle of alcohol to someone who doesn't drink or yep. you know is an alcoholic or something and I and I don't want and with peanut allergies and stuff, I don't want to be that guy who sends, you know, a walnut cookie and then you're like, okay, well now now I'm getting sued. So that's kind of the dicey part of doing it is to just kind of be careful and go mainstream, but nobody just wants like a box of just regular crackers. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's exactly. not very alluring as a gift. Yeah. So from here, Mike, where do you want to go in terms of building? I know after you're done with this big one, you're going to take at least a pause on taking on projects like that. But are you looking to get into any other asset classes? Or are you good with what you're doing now? I think I, I think I would like to, after I feel like I'm really stabilizing my systems and the portfolio and just kind of getting some of that money back, because this has been a huge, a huge spend on my side as far as capital goes. Yeah. And so get some of that sleep well at night money back, pay off, certain sources of of uh, capital that i've that i've drained down basically or utilized yeah. and then from there i think i want to go back to like some of my the things that give me fulfillment and so like i really like connecting people and helping friends out that's definitely one of my superpowers so how do i take that and turn it into something that involves real estate as well right 
And so I love, I love some of the stuff that you're doing and like the coaching aspect as well, right? So you're helping people yeah. get, get into the game. You're helping them change their lives and just helping them get from point A to point B a lot faster than they would otherwise, right? So that, that brings me f- fulfillment. So I like to do a little more coaching as time permits and yeah. take that a step further from what I'm doing now. I'm definitely helping people take a property, get it ready for Airbnb, get it launched and then managing it. But I think I can, I can pour more into that as I, as time permits. So just getting that time back and the ability to figure out like, Hey, what is next? What drives me? What fulfills me? And then going in that, going that direction. Yeah. I think it's good, you know, going into every project or every finish to look around. I was just thinking the other day, I need to look at my schedule and just prioritize my overall, you know, workouts and health better. But in order to do that, I need to get something off my schedule something major so that a a giant time block can reappear. Yours obviously is this big project. When that's done, you're going to feel like, you know, other than managing it, but you have, you know, the systems to manage that, that, that I think is important. And I think the thing that we've talked about and that we're similar on that we don't see in your kind of outbound social media coaching that I talk about with Alyssa all the time is just the mindset portion. You know, it's great to be focused on your doors and all these things. But if your life is all messed up and you don't have your finances in order, the investments aren't going to work. You know, have you found that over time that making sure that you're good has helped you make the portfolio smoother as a whole? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it comes back to the the concept of you need to help yourself before you can help other people. And if you are not in a position of clarity and peace mentally... It's very hard for you to work with people and have a positive impact. And I'll be honest, when I'm in a situation within a large project like I am right now, I'm definitely not the best version of myself, right? And you mentioned the health and taking time for yourself. That's that's huge. Whether it's you know your routine, whether you're meditating, whether you're working out, whether you're stretching, all those things are super important. And I'll be again, I'll be honest. When I'm busy, those are the things I skip. Yeah, and those yeah. things that go out the window because I think that I'm too busy to do that routine or get that workout in or too behind schedule on XYZ portion of this project. Right. And so I think that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very important thing to keep, keep in mind all the time as hard as it might be. Yeah. No, I think that's important. That ties into the overall kind of point of the podcast is like, can people focus on a more mindful approach to this? And when we met, I was like, oh, this guy's like me. <laughs> you know, we were talking right away. I'm like, oh, we're just going to hang out. This is yeah. this is great. Before we hop off, though, I know you go to you. I, I'm super introverted, but I went to BP and I was like, oh, this is awesome. What do you like about events that kind of charges you up when you leave a larger event, even if you maybe don't want to be around, you know, 2,500 people the whole time? Yeah, it's a good question. There's a lot of, I think, good things that come out of events for me, and that's changed over time. And even thinking back to when I was just kind of getting started, you'll look at social media and you'll be like, okay, like these people are doing X, Y, Z, or it's perceived that they're they're crushing it, right? <laughs> they might just be, you know, a guru with a lot of followers or fake followers, right? But when you go to events, you're creating relationships with people that are actually doing things and they're out there, they're getting their hands dirty and they're executing. And you can, you can kind of sniff that out pretty quickly and build those relationships that are impactful for you. And so that's how I started my, my journey, going to conferences and getting involved with real estate and meeting, meeting great people. Fast forward, you know, nine, 10 years being on this, on this journey. Now I purely just go to strengthen the relationships that I already have. And yeah. then obviously um, meet friends of friends like, like yourself and make those solid connections. That, that cool you know, that quality over quantity is is huge for me. Because think about BPCon, there's thousands and thousands of people there. There's no way you're going to be able to meet all those people and it, and walk away with like genuine, real um, relationships that are impactful. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I was kind of amazed that with the amount of people there, I didn't run into one person there the whole time that I thought was just bullshit. You know, everybody there really wanted to learn and was yeah. doing stuff. It wasn't, like a very passive group. Every person you talk to, you're like, oh, you know, is that person just sunbathing? And they're no, they have 13 units. You know, they've been doing this for 12 years. And you're like, wow, okay. I really think so. For for new investors who are listening to us talk about it, I think going to the, a, a bigger event is a huge, huge win. 
no matter what it costs, it's going to be a great spend, just like you said. Even if you're a complete introvert like me that needs to be dragged out, which is what Alyssa and then you were there. I was like, I'm not going to this last event. And then we went because I need other people around until I'm done. Then I just go home like I went home. (laughs) <laughs> before you guys. But I think yeah. it's important to know, uh, because I know you had built relationships, you knew a lot of people there. And we were talking about other conferences that you had gone to. But I think no matter what, you can always get the best out of the conference, even if you don't like the content, you know, it's what lobby cons for, you know, yeah. if you want to meet everybody who's there, make as many contacts. And then you're going to again, like you said, now you show up the next year, you have more contacts, and then you're going to mushroom that out. When you and I are next year, their next year, we're going to have even Cancun. better. Time. <laughs> Cancun, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I it. like it. Yeah. I prefer Cancun to Orlando. So I, I'm going to be ready. Awesome. Mike, where is the best place to people for people to find you? Is it on Instagram at mbrockway120? Yeah, that's it. I'm definitely most active on Instagram relative to other yeah. platforms. I think it's easier to respond to people's DMs there and use it as a hub. And the other stuff is just kind of, you know, going to be in your email anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So exactly. if you want to find Mike, go to Instagram and Brockway 120 or at Zen House. And that's H A U S dot homes. That's his other Instagram account where all of his Airbnbs. And if you go to the link there on the link tree for Zen House, you can see all the properties. <laughs> awesome. When's the last one going to be done? You think you said end of February, March ish now? I was shooting for end of February, but it's looking like end of March just so I'm not rushing things. And I, I make sure we're, we're, dotting our I's and crossing our T's and making sure we have that that high-end luxury product. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate your time. I'm glad glad we finally got this on the books after I told you like in October, I'm like, we're doing the podcast and we finally got it done. So appreciate you spending the time. Thank you. Yeah, man. I'll definitely talk to you soon. That was Mike Brockway. I'm Jonathan Green. See you next episode. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends, and be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening.